So this is going to be a rapid fire. Um, we only have 30 minutes. By way of introduction, my name is Panayota Betty Aguilito Fariello. I am the founder and CEO of Intellectual Law, the law firm of PB2 Fariello PC located in New York. Um, we have a very different approach to business law and intellectual and industrial property law. But we are also counsel, outside counsel, to the Bell Law Group, which is a preeminent labor law firm that finds itself often in the new spotlight, very much interested in women's football because we recognize that women's football is, in fact, good business. Our theme today is purpose and profit united. Because we as women really think differently when we engage in business. We typically have purposes that are much more global than just making money. It is a discussion that will show you um, how discussion and diatribe can be turned to action and to profit while simultaneously doing good. Good for the environment and good for our society. I have the distinct honor and privilege today to introduce two amazing women who have taken that very idea of uniting purpose and profit and have raised it to another level. On my left, I have Suzanne McKenzie. She is the founder and chief executive officer of Able Made, a public benefit corporation in the United States. She's also the founder and chairperson of the board of UCAL McKenzie Breakaway Foundation, a city youth empowerment organization for boys and girls ages 8 to 18 from low-income undeserved communities. On my right, most of you know her, but I will go through her bio because I think it deserves recognition. It is Karen Dobris. Karen's voice was unique on the Lewis FC board as she had no interest in football, just like me before Marios brought me in. Uh, she had no interest in football before encountering the club's equality, equality initiative in 2017. Since then, she regularly gives talks at business and sports conferences on equality and inclusion in football and its effect on driving gender equality in the wider world. Karen has led on campaigns and created the club's Sister Ships program, which includes groups like Sussex Police's He for She movement, Rise, and the Girls Network, which is building a network of organizations keen to support the club in solidarity with its equality stance while the club promotes the members' organization's work in return. So here's something that caught me by surprise. Karen is a trained counseling therapist including creating and managing an internal counseling service for Polygram Records, now Universal, and having a daughter in music, that also caught my interest. Um, she was a fashion model, no surprise there. A co-owner of the club since 2010, Karen led the Lewis board for its impact on the world from 2019 until 22. She's currently writing a book on her unlikely experiences in football, and complete lack of imposter syndrome. Can't wait for it to come out. <laughs> I'm gonna turn to you first, Suzanne. I really want to understand what your purpose was when A, you made AbleMade, when you formed AbleMade, and two, when you created UCAL McKenzie Breakaway Foundation. So I was a three-sport athlete growing up. Football, softball, basketball. And I want to celebrate everybody who is putting their efforts into empowering girls because I know for me it was such a formative experience to have sports in my life. I didn't know as an adult how much sports would impact me, you know, in my life. Um, 2009, I lost my husband to sudden cardiac arrest <sighs> when he was playing a soccer game. <sighs> and it really changed my life. And we 
We formed the nonprofit UCAL McKenzie Breakaway Foundation in his honor, and we followed with Able Made, a fashion brand that's sustainable and empowering in order to fund the foundation. The foundation is now 14, going to be 15 next year, and it celebrates the work that UCAL did as a first generation immigrant from Jamaica coming to the States and assimilating into the country through the sport and paying it forward as a guidance counselor, their boys varsity coach, and a youth mentor to underserved communities. Um, Able Made is also very empowering. It's sustainable fashion, and we are responsibly made, mostly in the USA, and it helps us tell the story about empowering our communities. So tell me, when you created UCAL Foundation, what was your purpose? What was your long-term goal? What was your objective? We wanted to really serve the communities that my husband was serving in Boston. We started in Boston where I lived at the time with him. And we really wanted to understand the needs of the community. Through sport, we built a curriculum that's very differentiated from the other youth programs. And we incorporated health, hands-only CPR and AED awareness were cornerstones based on what happened with my husband and him not having access to an AED during his emergency. Also nutrition, sports recovery, injury prevention, um, concussion education, and the list goes on. Suicide is a big topic and we really listen and, and partner with our public schools and our youth programs in order to build the curriculum year by year. Um, we're in three markets now between Boston, Hartford, and New York City. And um, we're really excited for the New York market um, as an opportunity to work with Gotham FC. They're gonna be helping us break into our third market. So we really wanna empower girls and youth that don't have um, the chances and opportunities that you know more privileged communities have. And um, 15 years next year is just incredible. You shared a story with me about how the AED that you placed with a particular organization actually saved a life. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I get goosebumps thinking about this, but a few weeks ago, um, because of the advocacy we've been doing with AEDs and distributing that throughout different leagues, um, the team my husband was playing against, um, called Kendall, had made sure that every single one of their club teams had an AED. And for the first time, they had to want, use one on September 17th in Boston. So just for cl clarification, the AED that we're referring to is a defibrillator, okay? Just to make sure you everybody understands. So what happened? Um, the player suffered sudden cardiac arrest towards the beginning of the game. And thankfully, they had an um, off-duty firefighter on the opposing team who knew exactly what to do. Um, and their AED was actually pitch side. So it's critical to have access to an AED right at the beginning of a, a medical emergency. Like the time is of essence. And um, it was pitch side. The first responder knew exactly what to do. And we had a successful outcome because of it. And I, I'm just blown away that we can say that a fashion brand and some of the proceeds that you know we donate into the foundation made that happen so we can quantifiably say our customers and our brand help save a life. Now I went on your website and I checked out ablemade.com and I was particularly interested in how you do good with your fashion brand. Why don't you share that with us? So we define responsibility in a very specific way, and we try to be as transparent as possible as to how we do that. So first is really how we manufacture. We're pretty much 95% manufactured in the garment district in New York City. Um, North Carolina produces all of our socks, and then we also produce a little bit in LA. Um, we offshore a tiny bit, and um, another pillar of responsibility is how we source our fabrics. So we have an upcycling program with Burberry that we just kicked off, so I'm so excited about that. And we use certified organic, um, cruelty-free merino wool, um, very, very diligent uh, eucalyptus fiber called Tencel. Um, I think my designers wanna kill me sometimes because I'm like, we have to get this right on the thread. They're like, oh my God, stop. So it's, it's very, very talk to, you know, really 
exhaustion sometimes on some of these details, but they're so important. You know, we have one planet, we have such, you know, the resources that we have are just, you know, we have to share them. And fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world next to only big oil. So we really have to work together to be more sustainable and responsible in our practices. So I think you indicated in the website that you're using uh, natural fibers. You mentioned eucalyptus, I believe. Um, but you also talked about um, uh, a particular type of fabrics and recycling. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that contributes to a better environment? So I would say we benchmark our responsibility for, for fabrics with upcycling. So using what the earth already has, and that's keystone to our responsibility program with Burberry. It's ongoing. They have unused fabrics that are available and they trusted us as an eMERGE brand. They've actually never done this before and done it publicly and that, you know, they're letting us open their library to unused fabrics and we remix them into our own designs and it's going to be an ongoing program. So we already launched our first collection and we're currently working on our second. Um, we're also doing a repairs program so people can return things. We're hoping the quality is good enough so you're not going to have that situation so much. Um, but we're very excited to really, you know, work with bigger luxury category so that you're getting such great quality fabric but also doing good by you know, being mindful of the planet and the resources we have. I wanna to turn to you, Karen. Um, what was your purpose when A, you became an owner, and B, when you got on the board of directors? <laughs> um, so, I, so Lewis FC is 100% community owned at the moment, so I am an owner of Lewis FC. Anyone can be, by the way, 50 pounds a year, or you can become a grander and own it for life. Um, and my purpose in doing that was because I believed um, in the things that the club stood for. So basically social justice and um, using football as a vehicle for social change. And I think the, the more I found out, because I didn't, by the way, I didn't even know that, that women played football before 2017 when Lewis introduced the equality um, policy. Uh, so that you don't have to tell your daughter that she's worth less than your son. And um, I found out more and more about football and women's football in particular, um, because I was drumming up a new market for our women's team in answer to the critics who said you shouldn't pay the women the same as the men because they don't get the same crowds. So I got more women to come by getting them angry. And my reason for joining the board, really, because I was still angry. I was still angry that I hadn't known, I'd only thought that men played football because that's all I saw on the TV or the back pages of newspapers. Um, I had gone to see a women's match and thought it was amazing and it made me feel more powerful as a woman. And I wanted all the girls and my daughter and every, all the women to see this. Um, because it demonstrated a kind of leadership and a way of being a woman that I wasn't used to. You know, like a, a strong, powerful way, not just a passive decoration. You heard that I used to be a fashion model, a passive decoration, right? So I, I wanted to see a different way of being demonstrated to me in public. And I was very motivated to bring other women. And so I stood for the board to give me more authority, actually, to give me more validity in terms of what I was doing and um, to get a crash course in sexism, what can I say? Okay, so um, what did you do to realize and fulfill your purpose? What were the actions that you took? What kind of convincing did you do? Well, so, so I, so, okay, so if we're, gonna, if we're gonna talk about money and markets, we need to talk about um, what markets we've got that sponsors might be interested in, right? So I set up our sisterships network, as you mentioned, and that was from the groups of women that I'd been to talk to, to uh, persuade to come to our women's matches, even though they didn't like football. So what, they're what I called unwelcome women. They'd never been welcome, and we had a chance now to make them welcome, genuinely, because we were telling them that the women on the pitch were paid the same as the men on the pitch. That if they come to our football club, they won't see themselves reflected in these women as undervalued. Um, and then 
I formalized all those women's groups into a sisterships network. To be brief, I'll, I can talk more about that at another time if anyone wants to know about it. But what I had was a ready-made market of women from all different professions and uh, areas who were gathering together in, in a public place every couple of weeks. And it was a place where sponsors could find women to market to if they wanted to. Um, and we also had that if they became owners of the club, of course, you could also reach them in our newsletters and on our app, our owners app, and in our owners town halls. So this was a, a you know, this was attractive. And um, I, so if, if we talk about in 2020, 21, we got Lyle and Scott as our shirt sponsor, and that was the first six figure deal in the championship, you know? And they wanted to come to us because of the community and because of the women because they were launching a women's range in their clothes. <laughs> and then Zero, our other main sponsor that came on last year, um, they did some research, they commissioned some research that said that Lewis FC women, after the Lionesses in the UK, were the most affinity-aware women's team's brand that there was. Right? And that was due to all the work we did, around, well, partly, around unwelcome women and the ways that we made them become welcome at our club, whether it was breastfeeding places, a statue of bisexual female pirates from the 18th century, a community garden, evenings where they could learn about the offside rule, but learn it from female players and coaches, not, forgive me, but no mansplaining from men, <laughs> and um, you know, at, at women's football chanting practices, um, just all sorts of things that we did. A nail bar in a beach hut, that didn't work. It's okay to fail, all right? Just trying things out that might work, might not work. Um, so, yeah, we, so I think, you know, um, we got that market so that we made the purpose and the profit unite. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Purpose and profit unite. I have a question for you, Suzanne. Um, as you launched your for-profit, uh, it's, it's a startup, right? Yeah, at this point, how old is it? We actually launched, relaunched in April 2022. And we were doing a lot of collaborations with different brands prior to that. So um, I would say about five years in, and we've done collaborations with Apple, with Project Runway, with Puma, um, and we kind of just stepped away from those, you know, limited edition apparel and accessory drops to really tell our own story and lean into the soccer heritage of the brand and why we started in the first place is to empower this, you know, soccer nonprofit to empower city youth and make stronger communities. So we relaunched in April 2022. Um, I'll never forget this because I'm so thankful we were being produced in the garment district in New York City because we had a shop in Central Park at a luxury um, one hotel. And I literally had to run, we had to run back to our manufacturer to pull stuff off the line. It was going like bananas. It was like, you know, COVID was like people were coming out. People were really excited about, you know, seeing an inspiring story. People were really connecting to football. And what made me even more excited is that it wasn't just the international clientele, which we were getting with the soccer story. There were so many people that talked to me about, oh, I used to play. I still play. My kids play here in the U.S. So that made me so excited to see that the game is growing here and that they could celebrate it through our brand. So, um, it's been a crazy, I'm overtired all the time, but it's been crazy since April of uh, last year. Um, as I mentioned, we launched the partnership with Burberry. We got into Nordstrom in like six weeks, which is unheard of. We're worn all over the NWSL, um, both m women and men without, within the Premier League, La Liga, PSG, and not only just the soccer community, but also the NFL, NBA, WNBA, I have a picture of Sue Bird actually with her feet up in the air wearing our socks. Um, it's just been incredible. And I will tell you, this has been done with zero marketing, like zero marketing dollars. People are just seeing their friends wear stuff. They're inbounding to us. Wasserman, the agency, reached out to me because two NFL players wanted our stuff. I was like, what is happening? Um, so we're actually raising capital now for the first time. And there's just this huge white space that we're filling that not only celebrates good style, responsibility, and inclusion, but celebrates the most popular sport in the world. So let me ask you this question. Have you 
um, achieved your financial goals. Uh, you said you're raising money right now. So we currently have a $1.2 million raise open. And I will say I'm very grateful to have that halfway done. Um, it's very hard for women to raise capital. Um, VC money went to less than 1.9% to women um, in last year. And that number was actually down from the prior year. So um, I have amazing people on my investment team, everyone from some Adidas and Nike vets that really understand the power of sport and how that translates to products. I have an NWSL team co-owner as an investor. I have Danone's B Corp director as an investor. And I have Safar Shah ESG founder and partner um, as one of my first, I call her an OG. Um, she's one of the first people in um, and including others as well. So I'm really grateful to be a little bit maybe ahead of what women normally get. Um, in this space of raising capital. So I've heard the disparities of, you know, the players from the conversations that have happened over the past two days, the players, medical, data gathering. I think across the board, we really need to invest in women and their ideas. And we're able to be resourceful to a point, but we really need that financial support to get to the next level very much. So would you say that one of your obstacles is financial support? My biggest obstacle is really catching up the working capital to the momentum of the brand that we've built. So it's like you're sort of up in the air, you know, flying your plane, but you need to refuel. <laughs> so that's my, you know, kind of metaphor for it. What kind of obstacles did you encounter in the process of trying to achieve your purpose? Loads. I mean, the money is a major one. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about how can we fund women, you know, and one of them that we, so when, when, when we get an obstacle at Lewis FC, we respond to it by trying to change it because we're fans of change. Um, the reason we're fans of change is because um, the purpose of a football club is actually to bring people together um, as, as well as playing football, right? It's to unite people um, and, to, and we think it's to do good, right? For your community it's a community asset in fact so what when we have a problem we try to campaign for change to address that problem so the funding thing a big thing that we can we can do or, or, or the FA could do um, would be to equalize the FA Cup prize fund and I'm very cheekily hanging a tote bag on my chair as you can see <laughs> which refers to the FA ban in 1921, where the, the all-male FA um, banned women from playing football, as, as we've already heard, in England in 1921, um, because they were trying to re-establish gender norms after the war, and, and maybe they were trying to stop women collecting at matches for striking minors, and maybe they really did believe that there was something gynecologically very bad about women playing football. Who knows, right? But they did ban women. And there's a lot of reparations that, that needs to be done. We spoke about yesterday, you know, we were actually owed something. Um, and when Lewis FC played Manchester United last season in the fourth quarterfinals of the FA Cup, I'll just drop that one in. Um, I think, you know, we got 400 and, what did we get? 400, 450 pounds and the, the men in the equivalent got, we got 4,500 and the men in the equivalent match would have got four. 45,000. I think that's right. So you can see there's massive differences um, in gen gender based differences and disparities in the FA Cup prize fund. And that really is, in my opinion, very, very easy to correct. You simply change the figures. The Premier League men's clubs that earn this money, right, through winning the FA Cup, they don't, it's a drop in the ocean, right? But the women's clubs that compete, it would make such a massive difference to them if we had an equal FA Cup. So this is just me on, on a bit of a hobby horse, because in answer to your question, when an obstacle comes along, what we do is we campaign to change it because we're fans of change, right? So we won't stop shouting about this until it's equalised. Our players actually wrote a letter about it uh, prior to the Manchester United match. And our amazing men's team are playing tomorrow uh, in the final qualifying round of the FA Cup and they're going to wear the t-shirts that we produced with the scales on the back talking about the FA Cup prize fund because they are total male allies.
So, of course, because our topic is Purpose and Profit United, are you profitable? We're getting there. And I have to stress we've never spent marketing dollars at all. And we've got proof of concept, de-risk the brand, and six-figure revenue with zero money. What are your projections? When do you think you're going to be profitable? We have three years. And I know you're speculating. Yeah. But just give us a, an understanding. And our projections, three years. Three years. And how's women's football going to tie in to you being f profitable? I think the influencers that we have are all organic and they're so excited about the story we're telling with the brand and in regards to how we're supporting our communities and supporting the next generation of players, including girls. So um, in terms of our sponsor dollars, we don't have to do a lot of spend for these athletes at the highest of levels to be excited about championing the brand. And I think that that's definitely part of our strategy in terms of influencer engagement, ambassadorship, and potential having them as investors as well. So um, we, I know how to stretch a dollar, like nobody's business. So um, I've had to just on necessity and it's gotten us this far. And I feel like once we get the funding, it's going to feel like triple the money because we've learned how to be efficient. We've learned how to build you know, relationships. We have a team that's so excited about where we're going. So they're energized and ready to go. Um, in talking to the investors, I never get the question about, you haven't done this yet. Get to this next milestone. I've never gotten that question because we're so. We're good? Yeah. Is we're that so my signal to cut it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have a little bit more time. We have oh. about six minutes. We're going to wrap it up. Are we working? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, so we've never gotten the question about execution. That's not our issue at all. Um, so where we've built a really strong foundation to, to grow. That's awesome. And what are your long-term goals now? Um, I, I would like everyone to change their Twitter handles, it's a football club, to at their women and at their men. So at Arsenal men and at Arsenal women, at Manchester United men and at Manchester United women. Just like we do at Lewis, with at Lewis FC men and at Lewis FC women. I would like every club to put on their website not first team and women's team, but men's team and women's team, or even women's team and then men's team. These are signals, guys. These are ways that we can change the world actually free. But then if we're talking about money, um, I, I would, well, you know, we would like to get our women into the Super League because that gives us a platform for our messages of equality. Already we've changed the course of history. You know, already we've showed people that said that you couldn't do it that you can do it, right? I like audacious goals, by the way. It's like, I, I like what JP's doing with the Women's Cup. I like what Anjali wants to do with the Indian Women's Football Alliance. You know, we, we need audacious goals. We need to think far, far ahead of just, um, sometimes of just being equal. And sometimes we need to think about equity and the context in which we all operate. So we are actually, at Lewis FC, moving from simply paying the women the same as the men to giving them more than the men because they, have, they operate at a higher level. And this brings along all of our fans and owners and everybody that knows us to a, a deeper understanding, actually, of gender equality and women's place in the world and male football privilege, which I will talk about for a long time if I can, but I know I don't have time. But I, I, you know, I want everyone to come along together using football to understand the impact that we have on society. You know, and, and, and I really recommend that you become owners of Lewis FC if you're not already, because that ownership model where we get money makes us sustainable going forward financially. There is no limit on how many owners we can have around the world. At this point, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Jim. I am both a proud owner of Lewis FC. I am also able made. Uh, more of a, an observation about the power of women and networking and this event. Suzanne is here no, in no small part to the efforts of our Perlene. Columbia student, our yep. sports marketing student, Perlene. Yes. Yes. Perlene sends me this email saying, Jim, you need to talk with this woman. 
And I said, okay, give me the scoop. She gave me a little a breakdown. I said, okay, yeah, I'll see what she's about. Boom, you're sitting here. Okay, and that is one woman. To another woman. To another woman, and the power of that. Okay, you're a Columbia, Columbia University sports marketing student. She's what studying did, for her master's. Okay, studying for your master's in sports marketing. What you've gotten here, no classroom could ever supply. Okay, because you will be in the driver's seat at Columbia one day soon, I'm sure. Okay, simple observation. Congratulations to both of you as well. Any other questions? No? Okay. So I would like to call everybody to action. One of the conversations that, that Karen and Suzanne ha and I had yesterday is, frankly, I'm tired of talking. I really am. The numbers and the data are in. We saw it with JP. Um, if he can convince Jack Daniels, and let me tell you, Jack Daniels is a pain in the you know what to convince about anything. They actually were in a very, very big trademark infringement lawsuit with bad spaniels, and they actually won the case that left the United States Supreme Court, and it went back down for a determination whether bad spaniels is confusingly similar to Jack Daniels. They are a pain, a real pain. Um, and so if he could convince Jack Daniels to put money into the Women's Cup, I think we could all convince the public and companies that in fact, purpose, saving the environment, promoting women, equality of gender um, and profit are in fact united. And I want you guys all to go back to where you came from and spread the word. Thank you so, so much for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you all so, so much. That was a pleasure. That's our final panel done. We have three minutes remaining in here and three people to speak. So 45, no, Mary, please. 45 Mary, seconds, huh? No, you have a, you have a. It's all I need. No problem. It's all I need. I don't make it long. No problem, Mary. Go 2019, I got asked by two men. Um, they said, uh, Mary, in two months, we want to arrange a big event. And we want pioneers from all over the world to come to Athens. And oh yeah, by the way, one of them is based in New York. I said, in two months, are you serious? Yes, we're serious. At that moment, say, okay, sure, sign me in. I've seen many events from that moment happening. But what I've always loved from Athens is away from the spotlights, these two guys were putting in the work. And these guys until today are putting in the work out of the spotlights to give pioneers a chance to share proven models to people who are now trying to be the pioneers. So a big, big thanks to two guys with their team who stood up. Beautifully said, Mary. And you can continue your round of applause. Marios Agasilos, please join us. You can have the closing words, please. Thank you very much. First of all, this is not possible without an incredible team. Okay, And from the very beginning, even though it did start with Aisilos and me, we've been very privileged to have some great people here. First, I want to say from our first host, Adriano Del Monte, you know, thank you for being with us for the fourth time. And, and, and the wonderful Sean Osimbo coming all the way from Kenya. Also, someone that, who, has, who came in originally as a friend and as a moderator has now turned into such a central and important part of what we do. Ed Bowers, where are you? Come over here. <laughs> I, do, I also want to ask Jim Gooley to come up here. Jim, who's been involved in the women's game for over 50 years. A new associate of ours, Perlene. Come on up here, Perlene Fang. 
Swagger, come up here. You've been, you've been wonderful this year writing great articles for us. Come on, come on. Come on up. <laughs> Vivian, you were here in 2019. You've always been here with us. Come on up. Okay. Vivian Faturo. Okay. Vasya, come up here. And, he, and this is Vasya here, who's been incredible this year also. Lina, come on up here. Lina joined us just uh, recently. We're very happy for, to have her on board. And unable to come all the way from the United States, uh, we, we have Labiba Khan also. Labiba, I know you're watching. Thank you so much for all the great work you've done. And Lilith, I don't know where you are right now because you're traveling more than me, but uh, thank you very much also for your incredible writing. Okay. And finally, but not least, Naomi uh, Castillo, who was with us last year, couldn't make it this year. She's very involved now in running and marathons. She'll be with us next year. Thank you very much, Naomi, for your help. And let's not forget before, uh, right after Aisilos and I say a few last words, we will want all of you to get together for a photograph because you are all part of our family. And we're all very grateful for you. And there's so many people that we're leaving out right now just for because of time, but you're all in our hearts and we thank you. You've come from around the world. You've shown once again commitment through action. It's commitment through action that makes change. And we are very grateful for, we have legends in this room, men and women who have contributed to the beautiful game of football, who have changed the world through the game, through their, through their innovation, their passion, their dedication, and their great character. And we thank you all because each one of you makes this world a better place at a dangerous time. Okay? And we call on both of you, all of you, Aisilos and I, call on all of you to join us again, not only just next year, but throughout the year. Because this takes work every single day, and you know it better than anybody. So congratulations to all of you for all the great work you do for women's football, and for girls and women and all of us. And we will be welcoming you here again next year and throughout the year. Aisila. We would like also to thank uh, the all the staff working, a part of the main team, the technicians, the photographers, mm -hmm. the amazing, the hosters for the amazing place, mm -hmm. the staff, the cookers, the waiters, everybody That's who right. works on the behind to deliver this uh, top level, top quality. Today's, today's we love. Today's that already already in history of the Athens family. Today we share each other love, passion, inspiration, solidarity, respect. We never forget. And the Athens 2000, the AWFS 2023 prepared for tomorrow morning. The Athens WFS 2024. That's right. We don't say goodbye. We just say au revoir. <laughs> and, uh, and and one last thing. One last thing. We, we have had amazing companies and organizations here. We talked about Lewis FC. We talked about uh, former, uh, former uh, owners and chairmen of great clubs. We see here on the board federations. We see clubs. We see companies like ISDA and Miller and Striver and AbleMade and Girl Power. All these organizations are through, once again, through action, are contributing to the women's game. So we as women's football, we support the clubs, the federations, the organizations, and the companies that support women's football. We're loyal to them, we support them, and then we bring more companies, clubs, and organizations to the women's game every single day. And our message is to the world that Athens Women's Football is here to be an advocate for women's football, to bring funding to women's football, and to unite the women's football industry. So let's do that together again, starting now and always. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>